My guest today is the author of The Bombshell Businesswoman, Amber Hurdle. Amber was the keynote speaker at the Vacation Rental Women's Summit in New Orleans in December of 2021. And she gave an amazing presentation that had a standing ovation at the end. Her talk was called Velvet Machete Leadership. And she talked to us all about personal branding and creating a business model that has foundations in confidence and self-love and (laughs) determination. And I am so delighted to have her on the show today to share some of her wisdom. This is the Vacation Rental Success Podcast, keeping you up to date with news, views, information and resources on this rapidly changing short-term rental business. I'm your host, Heather Bayer, and with 25 years of experience in this industry, I'm making sure you know what's hot, what's not, what's new, and what will help make your business a success. Well, hello and welcome to another episode of the Vacation Rental Success Podcast and Happy New Year. It's 2022. All right, that's all I'm going to say about it, really, because 2022 is not a lot different from 2021. Uh, If you listened to my discussion with Andrew McConnell last week, you know, he was talking about what happened when we went from 2020 into 2021, you know, was everything going to change on January the 1st as we stepped into a new year? Of course it wasn't. uh, And it didn't. And even though when we got to sort of November, October, November of 2021, and we're beginning to be almost beginning to see COVID retreating into the, you know, in the rear view mirror. And now here we are with it, you know, front and center of absolutely everything once again. But anyway, happy new year. I'm, I'm glad we got here. Uh, I'm glad to be back down in Gulf Shores for, for the next few months. I'm going to really enjoy the sunshine. Had a fantastic time over Christmas with my family and just just enjoying some great, you know, it was like having a holiday, having a winter holiday in the snow, knowing that I could escape from it at, uh, at, at the end. So uh, this week, I am super delighted to have with me Amber Hurdle, who is the author of a book called The Bombshell Businesswoman. Now, Amy Highnote of VRM Intel has been sort of teasing Amber for a number of months. Amber was uh, a guest on the Vacation Rental Women's Facebook group a while back, and she did a couple of Facebook Lives, and they were really excellent you know, excellent sort of little mini seminars on how we create our own personal brand and how we find our business mojo and helping, you know, not just women, but helping anybody that's in this business that needs a little bit of a kick um, to take it to the next level. She did a fabulous job. And certainly in the presentation she did at the Vacation Rental Women's Summit. She had everyone on their feet at the end, giving her a standing ovation for a a really, truly exceptional keynote address to start off the conference. And I think everybody came away from that with a name for that little entity that sits on the shoulder that always tells you the things that you can't do or the things that you shouldn't have done and admonishes you for something that's happened. Amber calls hers Gertrude mine is Morag. And I hadn't really identified and given that entity a name until that presentation. But uh, we'll, but we'll, I think we'll probably touch on that in this discussion. So without further ado, let's move on over to my super interview with Amber Hurdle. I'm so delighted to have with me today Amber Hurdle, the author of The Bombshell Businesswoman and just such an inspiring person. I sat there in the audience uh, for the keynote presentation at the Vacation Rental Women's Summit back in uh, December and was enthralled by that presentation. So I am just hugely, hugely excited to have you with me today, Amber. 
Well, that's saying a lot from an inspiring person who's award winning. <laughs> uh, I mean, you just were recognized that that same. You took the stage because you have a career accomplishment. So we'll just have to have a mutual admiration club on this episode. <laughs> oh, I like that. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> uh, this is going to be a, a great conversation, I know, because as I say, you, you really did inspire me with the keynote. And, and then I, I read your book. I read The Bombshell Businesswoman. I read your backstory and everybody needs to know this. So I just want to know what brought you to us at the Vacation Rental Women's Summit. So, you know, let's have the life history. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> How did you get there? Well, I was introduced to Amy Highnote. And as anybody knows, Amy is quite the force. She is such a powerhouse. And I was immediately just attracted to her as a person while we're talking about personal brands. And when she communicated the vision for the conference, it was clear to both of us that that was absolutely a perfect fit for me. Like there, there's nothing about that could have been improved upon for that to be an ideal conference for me to speak at. And so we started going down the traditional planning process as most conferences do. And then New Orleans, which is very, I'm, I'm very aware of New Orleans. I'm there like five times a year. Um, and they started shutting things down again mm. and things were getting canceled. So they, we had to reschedule, reschedule, as you know. And so I was talking to Amy and I was like, well, what if we did like a, like a webinar series instead, like not instead, obviously we'll do the conference, but what if we did a webinar series just to keep everybody engaged and to feed them? Because I think what most women needed in that conference wasn't like, how do I, manage my revenue. Like you went to, you know, darn for that. So not to say that's not important at all. All my revenue managers don't get me in trouble. So important. But this conference, I think people really just needed a breath of fresh air to be with their vacation rental sisters to be fed and restored. And so if they weren't going to get that after the killer year that this industry had with COVID, just making it such a high priority to be in a vacation rental, then how can we do that virtually? So Amy is always all about wanting the women in the industry to be thought leaders and to step into that role because you do have so much to offer women, men, not that you don't, but women are less likely, less inclined to put their self out there. So she was like, okay, this is really what I would love for them to learn about. We talked about the change cycle because <laughs> we kind of all went through it as a collective and as individuals. And so we just put together what we thought was the most important fuel, if you will, to recharge the women who, who came. And so we did that, which I loved because I got to know so many of you and you connected with me on social media. And so by the time that the reschedule, reschedule, reschedules finally got us all in New Orleans together at the Ritz Carlton, I felt such a deeper connection with this audience, which is why I stayed for the whole week. And I felt like I truly understood what your needs were. And so, you know, I, I appreciate everybody saying what a great keynote it was, but had you not given me all throughout the year and beyond what it was that you needed and interacted with me, there's no way I could have nailed it. It's usually about the audience and how they show up and less to do with me as the deliverer of the message. I think it was really apparent that you were not a keynote speaker that just arrived on the morning of the conference, walked on <laughs> yeah. the stage, gave your 45 minutes and then walked off and went home. Bye. <laughs> yeah. which, is, which is what happens mostly. It was, it was very clear that you were so invested in this group and and th there was so much rapport there. So, so thank you for that. It was, Absolutely. it was just brilliant. Let's, let's go back. Can we step back a bit, Amber? Cause <laughs> I've, I've read your book. I've read your backstory. And I think everybody needs to know this backstory about, you know, how, how you got to where you are now through, you know, what, what's quite a little bit of adversity. <laughs> Oh, yes. So um, the way that I like to say is just point blank. I got knocked up when I was 16. So I was the teenager, the high schooler who was involved in everything. I was president of this, vice president of that. And to the extent that Channel 4 News invited me to be a part of this series that they did for an entire week. So when I say I was a highly visible high schooler from a leadership perspective, that's the level we're talking about. And then I found out that I was going to have a baby. So 
that is the first step of adversity. Um, that relationship was obviously as about as good as a relationship between two 16 year olds could be <laughs> or trying to be adults. And, um, and there was, there was definitely trauma there and in dealing with that trauma and all the self betrayal and just some of the other things that I don't, I don't talk about publicly because there's other people involved, but we'll just say it wasn't pretty. And and healing from that extreme wound and healing from that big T trauma was, I just made a, a lot of bad mistakes. Was I the best mom I could possibly be? I will for, I will go to the grave knowing that I've been the best mom I know how to be, but I was also a teenager and I was also working four jobs. And there's two nights out of every week that I did not sleep at all for, for months. And so, um, you know, dealing with that and it was just like one day, from sheer grit and endurance and stoicism, <laughs> as we talked about pre-show of just accepting what is and, and setting my mind the way it needs to be. And a lot of the principles that I taught now just came to me during that season because I, it was either that or, or die. And, and I don't mean like a death, but like things would not be what they are. And I would probably not have my child or I'd still be on, you know, public assistance, which I never was on to begin with. Uh, you know, there's just, there's choices you can make to deal with what you've got to deal with or to lay in a corner and cry about it and hope that some, you know, knight in shining army is going to come rescue you. So yeah, I went through it. I abused myself. I made poor choices, but while I was doing that to myself, I was also learning concepts that I now understand are about personal branding. I was understanding how to position myself. I was understanding networking. I was understanding, oh, well, if I position myself with that person, they're connected to this or they can make a choice about that. And then those opportunities and the people that were better for my life were coming in. And it was kind of crowding out the space of the people that were maybe energy vampires, bad influences, you know, people who were encouraging me to deal with my stress in ways that maybe weren't the best ways to deal with it. And I joke that there are people who said everything I ever needed to learn about life, I learned in kindergarten. And I say everything I ever need to learn about life, I learned because I got knocked up at 16. Yeah, it's... <laughs> Well, that's a really encouraging story. <laughs> <laughs> but it is like, I have no shame around it. Yeah. Like none whatsoever. It just, it happened. I dealt with it. It was pretty. Sometimes it was the, the one thing I just, you know, people are like, oh, you're so inspiring. And I'm like, oh, if you stood beside me in 1999, <laughs> you would be very disappointed in me. Let me just tell you, I never want to be the guru on the top of the mountain that knows everything and has never made a mistake. I am not Jesus. He's the only man who ever walked the planet with no sin. I stumbled my way into success with grit and determination and honestly driven by the love that I had for my daughter so she could have every opportunity that would be afforded to her if she was not born to a teen mom. So you went into event planning and, yeah. and into and and from there into hospitality or was it the other way around? Um, well, I grew up in hospitality. So my mom is a chef and she has always been in the, the food side of hospitality. And my dad is a drummer. So he's always been on the entertainment side, both in the entertainment and hospitality worlds. And so I was raised in that. And, uh, you know, I, my, my earliest jobs were Applebee's and waiting tables, a cocktail waitress or whatever. And then I did, I, I opened up an event venue and I started a company called Planet Nashville as just a attempt to create a college fund for my daughter, a little side hustle, if you will. Oopsies. It turned into a full-fledged celebrity event planning company with Alan Jackson, Carrie Underwood, uh, uh, John Rich. I mean, I could just go on and on and on naming different celebrities, Sony Music. We did um, Hotel for Dogs World movie premiere with Paramount Pictures, Nickelodeon Studios. It, it just went bananas during the worst economic downturn in U.S. history before COVID in 2008, 2009, I was nonstop. So that was really probably where I got to be a business owner, understanding the dynamics of hospitality and understanding the fact that you have to be kind of touched to work in this industry. <laughs> It's either you have the spirit of hospitality or you self-identify and you exit the industry. Like those are your options. And then we had a tragedy happen in, in my world, the loss of a child um, who would have been my stepdaughter. And that shifted just a lot for me. And so I tried to have a normal life, which hospitality professionals, we were just not able to do that. And then from there, I ended up working for Gaylord Hotels. 
and uh, not normal, first of all, 2,881 rooms. Now the currently the largest Marriott in the world and the largest non-gaming resort in the country. And that experience, while it was the hardest, most difficult professional experience of my life, was also the most rewarding experience. It pushed me. I mean, wild horses could run over me and I'd be like, whatever, because of what I was able to accomplish with the team at Opryland. And so when I come at hospitality, I come at it from back of the house, front of the house, administrative support, leadership, schlupping, you know, learning how to take romaine lettuce off the core and doing it the right way and which knife to use because I would go on spring break to work with my mom. Like when I say I'm hospitality, it's in my bones. And I think that's what I love most about vacation rental professionals. It's in your bones. And I see it like even more so, and don't tell my hospital, my hotel clients this, but almost more so than even hotel. There's no fancy school to go to, to get your degree and vacation rental. There is no master plan where somebody walks you through this. You get through it and you stay in it because you earned your place. Yeah. I mean, most, most of us have started. In fact, the majority, say 90% of us, I think, start with our one house. Yep. <laughs> and we're renting out a one house and somebody comes along and says, Hey, you're doing a good job at that. Would you look after mine as well? And then another and another. And before you know it, you've got 40 or 50 and then you're looking for staff and realizing <laughs> that perhaps you had no real concept of what it was going to be like to be in business, right? in business, which is, which is why I loved your book because it, it, it te- really takes you from that nothing all yep. the way, all the way through to having a real plan, and and one part of it I just really liked was identifying what you're actually good at. Yeah, because we all go into this, and and I had so many people I talked to in New Orleans, and we we got into this discussion about the fact that you know what do we do? We're you know we we are absolutely everything in the business tapped. We've got to be the financial manager and we're the reservationist and we run the administration and we do the bookings, we do the reservations, we deal with the problems and we clean the toilets. (laughs) And that's how we all start. And so it's a bit, little bit difficult when you get into hiring people as to, you know, how do you Mm -hmm. tease out what you're actually good at and hang on Mm -hmm. to that and then pass out the rest. So I wanted to talk about this business mojo. How do you define this? (laughs) So it's the sweet spot. It's the, it's where, um, the part of your business that lights you up most and what makes you unique from your competition, which is typically where most people I work with have a struggle identifying, which is why I'm all about branding. And then that also has to overlay with what makes you the most money. So it could be that a particular part of your business lights you up. You love graphic design. Okay. Well, if that's then great, go be a graphic designer because if that part doesn't differentiate from your business, like if the aesthetics part is not going to be also something that differentiates you and can make you money, you don't really have a business. You have an interest. And if, if you are different from your competition, but you're slogging through it. And every day you're just miserable because it's really not in your wheelhouse. You're not in your business mojo. Mm -hmm. And on, you know, if you're making a ton of money, but it's not sustainable because you don't have any key differentiators. Maybe you just got on the top of a bubble or a boom or something like maybe a lot of people last year got into vacation rentals. It's a boom, Mm -hmm. but do you have it in you to sustain if the market shifts? So these are all things that you have to have. And, and then that helps you identify like what to prioritize and what to let go. What do you need to really double down on and spend your precious time and your limited resources on? And I'm sure Heather, you've been in this industry for quite a while. You've probably seen people burning the candle at both ends, spinning their wheels, getting nowhere and wanting to quit because they don't have this in check. And so as a business owner, and, you know, I'm sure we'll talk about the the business plan. Even if you identify every leadership management role as, hi, that's me. Like you said, chief bottle washer, toilet cleaner, that's me, CEO, (laughs) then that's fine. But by, 
by deciding these are the roles that I'm playing, you can very quickly, when you get to the point that you can start hiring, backfill those in, in the order of priority. And this is also, you know, I talk a lot about people data and I, I have a variety of different tools that I use, but it's really important to me, especially with a business owner to understand how, the, how they show up from a personal branding standpoint, like how are you most influential? We need to understand that because that's, that's influencing customer behavior. That's influencing employees. That's influencing investors, peers, whatever. And then I want to understand behaviorally, what do you need in a work environment? How do you make decisions? How do you interact with people? You know, what type of, you know, do you like consistency or do you like work that is, um, you know, has a lot of competing priorities. Are you crossing every I and dotting every T or are you maybe a little less formal and you're a little bit more of a rule breaker? If we understand how you show up and how people receive you and then how you operate behind the scenes, now we have scientific information to say, this is how you need to show up in your business. And here's all the bubble wrap, as I call it. Here's everything that you eventually need so you don't burn out working outside of your wellspring. So, you know, how, how do you define, define this? You know, how do you define what, what is, you know, what's going to be yours? And the other thing, the other thing I want to, so, so maybe just put that question on one side, mm -hmm. how do you make it not difficult in <laughs> hiring somebody who is not a carbon copy of you? Oh, you do not want the carbon copy of me. I, yeah. uh, my whole team, it, it, you need the yin to the young. You need, you need whatever it is that, you, let me, re, let me back up for a second. If you hire somebody who's completely opposite of you, there is likely going to be friction. So let me give you an example um, hot springs spas. I'm allowed to talk about them. They're a, a great client worked with them for years. They love when I talk about them. So no, <laughs> no crossing boundaries here. I would never do that for a client. They were understanding that they needed more people on the team, especially in a particular role that was very conscientious of the expectations of the SOPs, somebody who could really drive the bus, dot every I across every T and be a rule follower. So I took them through the process of identifying the type of person from a behavioral standpoint that they would want to hire. And they took it so far to the extreme. And I'm like, okay, guys all of you are rule breakers, every last one of you. And you think you're going to go get the parts department Nazi and y'all are going to get along. Like that's not going to work. So yes, we need to complement the team, what's missing in the team or what's missing for that particular manager or this, or the department even. And we need to make sure that we fill that space that's missing, but it can't be so far off that there's going to be conflict because that person's going to leave. They're going to be like, these people couldn't find their way out of a wet paper bag, like done, I'm, I'm gone. And so it is, it's carefully understanding your team and it's having a people strategy. What's your business strategy? What is it that you're trying to accomplish this year, long-term, the whole shebang? What is your people strategy to get there? And do you have all of the team members that complement each other in a way that's cohesive while also different enough where you have a holistic approach to getting to that business strategy? Yeah, easier said than done. I'm, I know I, the reason I ask this question because I am one. I, you know, I have a business partner um, in one of my businesses who is, just happens to be my son. And oh no, <laughs> that's a whole other dynamic. <laughs> yeah, but we are identical. <laughs> oh, you know, we we have a business meeting and we sit for a whole day and strategize, and everything is you know top down. And then we get to the end of the day and the, the fact So, what are the next steps? Or oh, we figure out how we're going to work this. And then we never do anything. And I think this happens. following through. Yeah, I think this, there's, there's nobody to follow through. So that, that, that really was the basis for that question because I know that this does not work, that if you're going out to hire, it, it's sometimes nice to, to have somebody that, because you think you do absolutely everything, so you want somebody just like you who can take on all the things that you do. Because uh, it's easy. Because it's easy. Yeah. But, but you don't get to the reward by taking the easy route. Mm -hmm. And so I think when another key thing with, I don't want to say accidental entrepreneurs, but maybe somebody who bought a house and oops, I have 40 now that what they have to understand is you there's leadership, which sounds like you're amazing at visionary. You know, th this is the, I can inspire you to move in this direction. 
I don't have to beg you to get things done. And then there's management, which is, did you get this done by the deadline? Well, if you're not managing the person to the job function, either that person's got to go or you've got to figure out what they need to help them get to that point. It doesn't matter what their personality is. If they're in a job function and they're not getting it done, that's a problem because we don't have money to spend to not create revenue. That's, that's just doesn't work that way. And if you think about employees being the number one investment for most businesses, I would say in the vacation rental industry and most business, small businesses in general, why would you not allocate time, attention, and financial resources to get that part right, just like you would to gain market share. So you're going to gain market share, but have no team to support it. And then you're going to, you know, Mm -hmm. be halfway into a bottle of Jim Beam at night because you can't deal with your business. Like that's not fun. And that's why, that's why I use people data because it just, it takes the guesswork out of it. It, You know, if you're, if you're not inherently like a super empathetic person where you can feel what other people are feeling, or if you're not, if you don't have a really strong intuition, Mm -hmm. then, and even people who have strong intuition still need the data because sometimes they're like, you went to Alabama, I went to Alabama, roll tide, you're hired it just doesn't work that way. You have to understand the functions. And so obviously by my book found on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, et cetera. But the other thing is, is reading the e-myth will help you wrap your mind around from, from a very storytelling, practical way. What are the roles that need to be in my business? Even if it's just me, it tells a story of this, of of a woman who owns a bakery and she was everything to everybody. And, and she had to build out her business in a more strategic way. And then the second thing is the whole, um, I'm going to say rocket fuel would be the first to read, but it's, um, what the heck is EOS? This is a whole series of books. They're actually in my living room. That's how much I believe in these. I'm doing an EOS implementation in, in March to, to get a client out of this. So EOS um, is what the heck the entrepreneur's operating system, right? But the reason why I want you to read Rocket Fuel is because it talks about the role of the visionary, Heather and Amber, (laughs) and the role of the integrator, the person who's going to GSD, get stuff done or whatever word you want to put in the middle there. So my first meeting this morning was with Shantae, who's my project manager. I'm the visionary and Shantae is the one who's going to get it done. So guess what happens when I'm like, and then we're going to do this. And what if it's this? And she comes back and says, that's not in accordance with what our plan is. Those are not the priorities that you, Miss Visionary Amber, said were going to be the priorities. So she, not only does she bring me back to reality, she makes sure that things get done. So I can just move on being fully Amber. Again, I showed you my calendar for January. I'm not even going to be in town, but maybe five days. But things are getting done behind the scenes because that's Shantae's role. I If, if it was me, it'd be all, October. And I'd be like, Oh, we never did that. Huh? I have such a great idea that I had. So putting these as a business owner, whether you're male or female, making sure that you're operating in your wheelhouse and, and just, you know, divide a paper in four, just divide a paper in four. And if I could find the worksheet, I can send it to you. You can just send it to everybody for free. Who wants it, who wants it, but the, you want to make sure that you put, this is what I'm good at. I like doing and I should be doing with my time. This is the highest and best use of my time if we want to get real estate about it. Then we have, I like doing this, but I probably shouldn't be doing this. So for like me, graphic design, I'm okay enough at it. I really enjoy it, but is, is that how I need to be spending my time? Probably not. Then there's the, I don't like it, but I can do it. And then there's the, I don't like it and I can't do it. So like coding, advanced math, listen, I got a bookkeeper. I have a a CPA and I have a payroll manager, not my spiritual gift. I don't even know how to do it. I would spend three days doing what it takes them two hours to do. So be really clear about what those are. And for a while, you might have to do all the things I had to do all the things at one point, but you could start being strategic about what you offload and then think about what type of personality needs to be the kind of person who would really enjoy to do the, that kind of work. Cause it's not, can I do the job? It's, will I do it job, do the job and will I do it well over a prolonged period of time? That's interesting that, uh, that you, you mentioned that about finances because my very first hire in, in our, <laughs> Same. In our property management company was a bookkeeper. That's right. Same. You know, when some, when, when I had an accountant who, who was trying to t- walk me through year end, and Mm-mm. profit and loss and like 
no, <laughs> I'm not going there. I have someone who could perhaps uh, do this for me. And uh, we, we found somebody who did that. She's now, she's been with us 15 years and she's, See? she's our office manager and she does all that wonderful stuff with numbers. She also understands our property management system inside and out because that's, that's within her. She likes to get deep and down and granular in the detail. Mm -hmm. And you have somebody, mine are external vendors, but I mean, I've just emailing back and forth with one of them this morning. I could pick up the phone and call the owner of the company and say, and it's like, Hey, Amber, how's Gibbs? That's my dog. You know, we talk about, they know everything there is to know about my life, my business, my vision, my goals. And they answer my questions like that, as opposed to me researching online, what the laws are, or, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, it's just, it, it, and other people, like I, I was doing some laser coaching. I was so blessed to be able to laser coach several women, um, as like a little bit of a bonus at, at the, um, women's summit. And one of them, she was like, give me all the numbers. I want all the spreadsheets. I'm going to nerd out on this. I'm going to watch Netflix and pet my cat and do the numbers. And I was like, peace be with you, sister. And then that type of personality might not like the marketing side as much or the networking side as much. Great. Whatever it is that you need bubble wrap for, meaning I need to protect this less than helpful uh, part of my personality for where I'm trying to go. We'll just bubble wrap it. That's your first hire. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Let's, let's just go back or forward or whatever to the difference between a business brand and a personal brand. Because oh, I, yes. You okay. Know, th that, that sort of evaded me a little. I've never really thought about personal branding. Although I know I and do. you have such a strong <laughs> personal brand. That's so crazy too. <laughs> so the business brand, and especially if you, it depends on what your exit strategy is, right? So if we're talking small business, I mean, we could talk about this from a variety of, of lenses, but let's just talk about it specifically in the vacation rental industry. If your exit strategy is you want to sell your business, you need to separate your personal brand from the business brand, because if you're attached to that, then you don't get to sell it because the success factor is you. So you want to make sure that your business brand separate from you owning it has its own reputation. What are people saying about your business? Just like a personal brand is what, what are people saying about you when you're not there? The difference is the way that you go about it. When you're working on your business brand, you do have visuals, you do have um, a content strategy, you have a variety of ways that you put yourself out into the market to create an emotional connection with your customers. And so I gave the example of Nike um, on stage at the Women's Summit. Nike is just do it. You have the Nike swoosh. Everybody knows what that is. The emotional connection to it is just like this aggressive, athletic, you know, really I'm in charge of my own destiny kind of vibe is their brand, but how they market to their unique audiences is going to be different if they're marketing to a performance athlete than to a soccer mom who might be interested in their athleisure wear. You're going to talk about different things. So when you're working on your business brand, you need to subdivide your different um, ideal customer profiles so that if you are, if you're, trying to go after, you know, families in a, in a very specific market. Like I know, um, all my people in, um, South Walton beach in Florida, like I know your people, Tennessee, Georgia, I think they said Alabama, but pretty much Tennessee and Georgia were, were two of the big ones. And I've done a lot of work in that area. So I've done that market research. Um, and so how you're going to talk to a suburban wife who has 2.5 kids and a dog, and she wants all these different things is going to be very different than maybe in the off season when you might be targeting businesses who need to have um, like strategic planning space or an offsite type thing. Don't try to sell them the same thing. They're going there for very different things. They have different needs. They're worried about different things at night. They have different outcomes that they expect. Speak their language uniquely. Now, personal brands really has more to do with you. And then when you are inherently projecting who you really are, not who you want people to think you are, but who you really are. And people receive that. And there's no disconnect between who you are and what, how people perceive you, then you're going to attract the right people and opportunities to you. Whereas you push a brand out for a business brand, you attract people in with a personal brand. Um, and you obviously flawlessly do that, whether you intended to or not, but 
you make good decisions about who you associate yourself with, about what you get involved in, about the type of things that you talk about on social media, about how you show up when you go to different types of conferences like the women's conference. Everything about your behavior needs to align with who you are at your core. And the problem is so many of us try to hide that light inside of us so that we can fit in. And the entire concept of branding is about standing out. I I love the Jeff Bezos quote. Yes. Uh, Your personal brand is what people say about you when you're not in the room. (laughs) That's my favorite definition. Yeah. I, 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 I love that. I sort of stepped back from that and I thought, no, I don't really want to go there. <laughs> <laughs> well, and listen, I know, listen, I'm not for everybody. And that's another, that's another thing about a strong brand, whether it's a business brand or a personal mm-hmm. brand, a strong business brand. I want you to land on my website, which we've got a lot of work to do. We haven't updated it since COVID, but I want, I want you to land on whatever it is I do and immediately think, oh my gosh, she's for me. Or, oh my gosh, she's not for me. Because what happens with the business, if you start to attract customers that you don't really even enjoy serving that are not really a good fit for you, think about your referral sources. Now they're going to refer their friends who are just like them. And you're going to have this entire book of business of people you don't even want to work with. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing in your personal life. If you're trying to fit in and you're trying to extend yourself to be something you aren't really, then you're going to attract other people like that. And now you're stuck in this vortex of of, an inauthentic life. And so if you will just be brave enough to say, this is what I'm about, and it's going to turn some people off because listen, sister, I do that all the time. (laughs) Uh, I do that all the time. Uh, if you don't like straight shooting, you know, wrapped in love velvet machete, then I, you know, there's billions of people in the world, go find somebody else. If you do that, then you're going to start to attract people who also crave authenticity, who accept you for who you are, who give you grace when you don't get things right, because they know what your heart is. I would rather have that life and have the discomfort of rejection on the front end to have the abundance on the back end. Oh, I love that. I love that. Tell us a story about James at Urban Grub. Oh my gosh, James. <laughs> so, uh, okay. So James is the, the lead server and the trainer at Urban Grub, which if you ever come to Nashville, you absolutely have to go there. It's one of my favorite restaurants on the planet. And so I was there and uh, my favorite server, the only one who'd ever waited on me before had moved on. And so we had whoever, and she was lovely, nothing wrong with her. Uh, just wonderful as everybody is at Urban Grub. But then I saw this gentleman at this 12 top and he was, he was on fire and he was selling it. He was selling the menu and he was ticking things off his fingers and everybody was fully like leaned in body language was through the roof. This energy was just like a vortex around this table. And I was like, I want him to be her server. <laughs> what? Cause I entered dining to me is entertainment. Okay. My mom's a chef. So, um, so he happened to come over to deliver our food, helping out the server. And he said, my name is James. If there's anything that you need from me, he introduced himself. We said our names and, and I was like, he's so smart. He gave us his name. So we could ask for him the next time. He's no dummy. James is no dummy. Now that we're friends, I know this. And so he leaves and, and before we left, he was at that 12 top again. And we're like, James, it was so nice to meet you. We're going to ask for you next time. Thank you for, you know, being, being helpful tonight. And he was, he said, Oh, Jeff and Amber, it was a pleasure to meet you. I can't wait to see you next time. Remembered our names y'all. And I'll just tell you right now. So he's literally everybody's best friend. So I'm not all that special, but I like to think I'm somewhat special because he got more coverage in my book than anybody. So, which he pointed out to me, I didn't even know that. So I was, I was at the women's conference with you and it hit my son last minute, ADHD, you know, bless him. A wonderful kid, but just very last minute about things said, Oh, I want to, I want to go see James at urban grub. So I text messaged my daughter and I said, I don't, know if I have the time for the back and forth. Can you text message James, who's also in her phone and just see if we could squeeze in a table for Derek's birthday. Not only did he squeeze us in a table, we got a great table. We had, you know, everybody came out. It was beautiful, wonderful. He knew exactly what Derek would want. He knows exactly, he knows what to put into the go thing for me. I mean, like you just, you show up and he just orders for you. It's just the most magical experience ever. And all of that began simply because he showed up fully who he was. Now think about being a server, a career server. We're not talking about I'm working at O'Charlie's making tips off of a $15 bill. We're talking about somebody who wants to attract 
and retain customers who are going to order a certain amount of food, who are going to be fun to work with, that might let him be exploratory with what he chooses for them, who are going to drink wine, multiple courses, get that bill up. If he has an entire night full of people that he loves working with, that he considers friend, and he's making the maximum number of tips, both because of the bill and because they're generous people who love him, that's a different kind of job than I'm slogging through a night dealing with a bunch of Nancy's with low ticket prices and people who don't really appreciate the art of hospitality and aren't going to tip well. Like he's smart. That is win, win, win for everybody. Yeah. That's just a great point. I, I just wrote down here reservationists. Mm, uh, yes. Because this is, you know, this is something that we're, we're working with with our company is, is to have our staff feel more aligned with our owners Mm-hmm. So that when they're selling, they are selling their owner's specific properties. So, yeah. so, you know, what you're saying about James, it's like, yeah, this is what I want. This is what I want my guys to feel like. I yeah. want them to feel that they have some ownership. And it sounds, you know, James has ownership of. And of therefore, <laughs> so, oh, he does. He, yeah. He's totally the boss of me. Um, and, and so if you think about, he's the one who's training all of the other servers, So now all of the other servers are learning that they have to develop a personal brand. So what happens when you have a ton of amazing personal brands and we're all like, I love so-and-so. And and, and like one time, actually, I had um, the gals from Thanks for Visiting were in town and we went out to dinner and took them to Urban Grub. Well, James wasn't in town or something. So he picked a server that he felt would just like live up to my expectation and take care of my people. And they were equally as impressed with him, not even knowing what they're missing with James because everybody, everybody owned every personal brand has to own the business brand. This is not somebody else's job. You as an employee of the business brand are the brand. So your personal brand has to align with that. And when you have a bunch of strong personal brands leading the employer brand, meaning I'm leading the people, we're all in this together and everybody's happy on the employee realm, then guess what happens to your customers? They're happy too. Now you have a strong business brand. You have to have strong personal brands, a strong employer brand, meaning I can attract and retain the right employees and a strong business brand all three of those deserve your time, tension, and resources, or you're screwed to just be real. Brilliant. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, we're moving on. We've got to move on really quickly because okay. I, okay. I don't know where my time is going. Um, creating- <laughs> we could talk forever about this. <laughs> <laughs> you talk about um, creating a bombshell business plan. So yes, what are the key steps in there? And you're going to have to, to do this quick. Oh. Condense it. Okay. So first of all, we've talked about this already. Identify, and this has to be simple. I'm not asking you, this is not something you're going to turn into your bank. Okay. This is for you. It can grow into that, but it's simple. You need to identify your management team, even if that's you, even if you're playing all the roles, what are your roles to, um, to fill them? Or if you do have those roles in place, whether it's marketing, you know, operations, whatever, If somebody leaves, what's your succession plan? Is there somebody on the team that you can roll up? Is that something that you're going to have to hire, you know, maybe some external help to recruit? Is that something that you can find in your market? I don't know, but have the plan. Um, And if you don't have a team and you just need to think about if money was no object, who would I hire first? Then we have to do the SMART goals, specific, measurable, assignable is the word I use uh, because I like to delegate (laughs) realistic and time related, right? So it has to be time bound or it's really not a plan. It's just kind of an idea. Um, And then of course the SWOT analysis. And listen, I just did this for my 2022 with this Omni variant coming out. What is your competitive advantage? So hopefully you address that in your branding. What do you do really well? You do that already through your business mojo. So see there's overlap. What resources exceptionally help your operation? I talked to somebody who brought all of the laundry in house. Well, Guests don't understand the the importance of that, but everybody listening to this podcast understands the importance of that. It was a key differentiator. What are you most proud of? Um, Who on your team are superstars? These are the questions from strength. Then we all know weaknesses, opportunities. What shifted in the market? You all had a huge opportunity with COVID to take market share away from hotels. And then threats. What are the areas of concern? 
what's making you lose sleep at night? And um, what would you immediately change to improve upon your business if you had all the time and resources to do that? Um, obviously, we do live events and um, and I'm a speaker. So a major threat is this variant to us. And we have to have a plan B for that. Again, I don't want to end up in the corner crying. I would rather just have plans B through Z. And then we have to talk about our chief competitors. I do not want you to dwell on what your competitors competition is doing, but you do need to be aware of them and um, what are their strengths and weaknesses and how can you separate yourself from them? And then um, what goals do you have in terms of uh, professional services you might need to grow? So you hired a bookkeeper immediately. It might be some HR help. It might be recruiting help. It might be leadership coaching. It might be you need a real estate agent. Who do you need to bring in in order to be successful? What problems do you need to support to solve? And um, and then is there is there any advisory role, whether you create a board or you find a mentor or you join a program or whatever that looks like, what kind of advice do you need to feel fully supported as a business owner? And once you get all that mapped out, and this is all in my book. So, I mean, I'm not trying to hard sell my book, but like it's in the book and there's a free workbook that goes with it. You just download it. So if you're feverishly writing notes, stop take a step back and post, you know, shut down COVID. We're not out of COVID yet. And before we get into this new season, take a step back and, and map out a real plan for where you're going next. Mm -hmm. That was pretty succinct. <laughs> I know, probably not as fast as you wanted, but no, it was, it was brevity is not my spiritual gift, Heather. <laughs> that was that 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 was perfect. And I loved that you included SWOT analysis because I will do that for everything. Yeah. You know, we're, we're getting a dog, we're getting a rescue dog and I'm doing a SWOT analysis on getting the rescue dog. Oh, you and I would be best friends. <laughs> you know, we're, I'm coming to Canada. <laughs> we're getting this dog. We're getting this dog from Egypt. It's coming from Cairo. It's a German shepherd. Oh, <gasps> that's so exciting. I but had yes, a German shepherd you know, lab next. my about, baby. I had to think about everything, you know, you do lots of different things to think about. So I do a SWOT analysis on it. Um, that's so perfect. So, uh, so yes, I use, I use this all the time. So glad you mentioned it. And the book, of course, there will, there will be a link to the book in the show notes. It's one of the best little business books that I've read in a long time. I really, thank you really, for that. It was just you know, for, for so many people who, who I know who are starting out in this business and the really is, you know, that there, there is no blueprint, as you said, you said earlier on, you know, you, you, there is no school for, for doing this. And th there, there are resources out there from people who've done it and are going to give the real practical stuff about what property management system to choose. <laughs> and, yeah. And What's your tech stack? That's a whole thing. That's a whole, and there's, there's a whole chapter about that. Yeah. You know, but, uh, but this, this, I think, you know, there's a lot of the soft side in there. Um, I, I did, uh, there's, we, we didn't touch on it, but about personas and avatars and, you know, knowing who your target customer is. And you, mm -hmm. you did refer back to that earlier. So, so yeah, I'm, I'm hoping that people will having listened to this conversation, will go and pick up this book because I thought it was super useful. But before we finish, you had just sort of touched on networking as, as you were talking about the business plan, you've got to go out and talk to people. That's right. Can you give a, uh, you know, finally give us some tips on networking successfully even for those people who are introverts, because I know there's, there's some out there saying, I don't want to go, you know, I, people who struggle are going to conferences or even joining a, a network of other managers because they feel that, you know, I'm just starting out in this business. How can I, how can I fit in with people who've been doing it for, for mm -hmm. a couple of years? So what, what tips have you got for them? So the first one is to only network where you will create two-way relationships. I see so many people just like, oh, I'm going to go to my local chamber of commerce and they have no plan. And I'm not saying the local chamber of commerce isn't a great place to be. Um, I'm just saying be strategic about what it is that you need in networking. Typically that's, I need people in my industry to get me <laughs> like who just are good, you know, thought partners or to share best practices, um, who can help me shorten my learning curve. Or the second thing is maybe my customer is there. And then the third thing is maybe a referral partner is there somebody who can refer me to the right people to become customers. In any of those scenarios, there is a return in your time and energy investment. So be smart about where you go, create a plan for that. There's a plan in the book. The second um, thing that you need to consider 
is um, you don't have to like forget about an elevator pitch. When have you ever been stopped in an elevator? And somebody's like, before we get to the first floor, can you tell me what you do for a living? Like, just be real, just show up as human. That's why it's important to have a strong personal brand because then you're operating in just how you naturally are. But especially if you're introverted, you don't have to even talk. You know, the best answer, the best way to have an amazing conversation is to simply ask the other person about themselves. People love talking about themselves. Ask them about like, well, how did you start your business? Wow. I didn't think about that. Or have you always been in this area? Well, what was your number one struggle? I mean, you could just keep asking them and you get to talk this much and they get to talk all that much. And now you're creating connection and you don't have to put yourself out there until that trust is built and you feel comfortable doing the same. I love that. I love that. And yeah, you're absolutely right about, I remember going back to business school years and years ago and the elevator pitch. It's like, yeah. No, I I like that. Just just ask, (laughs) ask questions. Yeah. Just find out about, just open up and say, where are you from? How many properties do you manage? Um, Yeah. What's, what's, what's most, as you said, what's most challenging for you? You know, people love to do that. Um, Amber, it's, it's been absolutely fantastic talking to you. And, and as, as you said, we, we could go on and, and <laughs> do this for much, much longer. I feel like we need martinis or something next to Heather. <laughs> I, th- I think, I think we need a part two. <laughs> um, well, I'm always happy to come back. Can you, uh, can you just share, um, a little bit about what you actually do beyond keynote speaking? Yes, I'd be delighted to. So we we do um, three different things. We do speaking, uh, we do consulting. So if you need, maybe you don't want to hire an executive because you don't have the budget for that, but you need an executive brain, then I can do consulting with you at different levels. And that's everything from hiring to branding and everything in between leadership. Um, and then probably where my heart really things are my online offerings that are targeted towards professional women. We do get leaders from large companies, but mostly we, we attract female business owners. So we've got the bombshell business Boot Camp starting in February. I'm actually giving a massive discount to women in the vacation rental industry that will be coming out in the next day or so. And, um, you can find out about that at amberhurdle.com forward slash bombshell business Boot Camp. And the reason why I like working in that space is because I'm not going to drag you through a course you don't have time to take. We're going to go through this basic business plan and even shorten it down to what can I get done these eight weeks? And then I'm going to ride your tail and I'm going to encourage you and I'm going to give you the resources that you need. And my team is just going to hover around until you have a massive shift, both from a business perspective and a confidence perspective. And if we haven't accomplished that, then we haven't done our job, but 10 out of 10, (laughs) no, I'm going to be in your corner. This dragon's coming for you. (laughs) All that information is going to be on the show notes. So, you know, take a look down there and, uh, and get in touch with, with Amber, there will be, um, information on how to do that. So, Amber, thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. It's been an absolute, absolute pleasure. We didn't get a huge amount of, of opportunity to speak at uh, in, in New Orleans, um, but I do hope we get the opportunity to uh, to get together at some point in the future because we. Oh yeah, you, you guys don't get to dump me. I'm in your industry now, so we're, <laughs> we're in it. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you so much, Amber Hurdle. That was just wonderful. A bit of a meeting of minds, I thought. You know, we we, we had a bit of a discussion pre-recording. We were talking about stoicism, because if you listen to the conversation I had with Andrew McConnell the week before, oh, you know how you know deeply I'm getting into that philosophy. And Amber is is definitely on that same track too. So we 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 had that in common. Uh, she's also a podcaster, and you know, interv- podcaster interviewing podcaster, always a fun thing to do. So, as uh, as I said, uh, Amber's book, uh, you can find a link to that in the show notes. Please go there. She's offered a worksheet which uh, you can download. So, so go there and um, do that thing. So, that's it for, for the first episode of 2022. And we're up in the 400s. So, 2022 is going to see episode 500. It's going to see the millionth download. 
and we're just going to keep our keep right on going. So if you have any suggestions on people I could interview or you know somebody you'd like to hear from, particular topics you want to hear about, just let me know. It will be so delightful to hear from you and share your thoughts with uh, with our audience in terms of topics and and people. So as ever, if you if you like this show, you know, even after this many episodes, I still love to get the, you know, a five-star review. I still like it. So go on over to wherever you download your podcast and leave me a review. The more reviews we get, of course, the more people get to hear about the show and the more people who come along and listen to it. So that's it for another week. I'm so glad you've allowed me into your ears again, and I'll look forward to next time. It's been a pleasure as ever being with you. If there's anything you'd like to comment on, then join the conversation on the show notes for the episode at vacationrentalformula.com. We'd love to hear from you. And I look forward to being with you again next week.